So I want to start with some stories. This is a picture of a 15-year-old boy. It's a picture of an epidemic that's sweeping across the United States right now. Since 1980, we have tripled the number of obese children. And now, children over two, technically one-third, are obese. Now, this epidemic has costs. And one of the more profound costs is the rise in type 2 diabetes, a kind of diabetes that used to afflict only elderly people. In some communities now, one half of the new cases come from kids. The cost of this obesity is $147 billion annually in direct health care costs. And it leads many people to wonder exactly why is it we've seen this extraordinary rise in such a short period of time. Well, the short answer is something to do with what we eat. There's a consensus among people who know something about this matter. We eat too much of this stuff, not too enough of this stuff. And it's not technically sugar that we eat too much of. It's instead high fructose corn syrup. Now, 40% of the products in your supermarket have high fructose corn syrup in it. Why is that? What explains that change? Well, the answer is that corn is relatively inexpensive relative to sugar. And that leads many people on the right to say, well, the free market did it. Nothing we can do about that. But people on the right ought to hesitate a little bit before embracing this particular free market. Because there's a lot of mucking around with this market, making it very much less than a free market. So for example, sugar is so expensive in America because tariffs protect the sugar industry in America. Tariffs benefiting the sugar producers by about $1 billion a year and costing consumers $3 billion in higher costs as sugar is two to three times the cost of sugar in other comparable developed nations. And corn is so cheap because corn is subsidized in America, $74 billion in the last 15 years, leading some economists to calculate that the cost of producing corn is actually negative. It pays to produce corn for certain corn producers. And so when you put these two facts together, high cost for sugar, low cost for corn, we see a radical shift in the cost of food. So in the period 1997 to 2003, the cost of vegetables went up by 17%. Cost of a Big Mac went down by 5.4%. The cost of a bottle of Coke went down by 35%. And we see a radical shift in how food gets made. I think many of you must have seen this film, Food, Inc., which describes because corn is so cheap, corn is the way that we feed cattle, that's extremely profitable for the factory farms that produce these cattle, not so profitable for the cows, because of course cows' stomachs don't digest corn properly. So we have to feed them tons of antibiotics, which of course filter out plentiful of these E. coli bugs, which are now resistant to antibiotics. All of this because corn is so cheap and sugar is so dear. Now, this likely might lead some people to ask, why is there so much anti-free market silliness here, driving these inputs into our food economy so drastically in the wrong direction? And none can prove precisely why, but this is what we can say with confidence. An enormous amount of campaign cash, primarily from ADM, corn producer, um, or uh, producer of products that depend upon corn, and from Florida sugar producers, which has driven the campaigns of both Democrats and Republicans towards protecting sugar and subsidizing corn. So if because of these campaign contributions, we can say campaign money distorts the market that distorts food production, which then distorts our kids. Here's another story. You might have heard of this place, Wall Street. Wall Street's just told us a lot about a decline, which in 2008 represented the largest decline since the Great Depression. What is it that produced this extraordinary decline? Well, there's a very compelling story told in this book by Simon Johnson and James Quack, 13 bankers, which accounts for this decline in, as the product of a perverse mix 
of both too little government and too much government. Too little government, aka the deregulation of the financial services industries, a story that begins in the 1990s with an explosion of, quote, financial innovations. These innovations, though, were invisible to the market. They were invisible to the market because rules which typically required that financial instruments be transparent and public and traded on public exchanges didn't apply to these new innovations. I asked a colleague to calculate how significant that was. He said in 1980, 98% of the financial instruments in our economy were traded on these public exchanges. Public exchanges which told their price and guaranteed they were subject to anti-fraud regulations that would make sure that the traders were behaving properly. By 2008, 90% of the financial assets in our economy were outside of these publicly traded markets, over the counter in this shadow bank it, bar banking market, which encouraged, Quack and Johnson said, the bubble which we saw, which brought down our economy. Now, that is not enough to explain exactly what happened here. In addition to too little government, we've got to talk about a little bit too much government, because throughout the 1990s, there was a very important signal the government increasingly gave the gamblers on Wall Street that there was a guarantee in their game of gambling, a guarantee that when the bubble burst, there would be a bailout on the other side, making the gambling quite a sensible business proposition, a they win if it's heads and we lose if it's tails proposition, leading some to argue that this is the dumbest form of socialism ever invented by man. We socialize the risks in this economy, but privatize the benefits. We, the taxpayer, pay for the cost, but the players on Wall Street, the gamblers on Wall Street, get all the benefit when there is no cost. Now, anyone looking at this, and people on the right and the left both, look at this structure of the too-big-to-fail market we've produced and say, this is insanely stupid. So what is it that led us to produce this insanely stupid way of regulating our financial markets? Well, again, political scientists will say none can prove, but this is what we can say with confidence. The fastest and most significant growth in campaign contributions to the past 20 years has come from the financial services sector, leading both parties, primarily Democrats, in the change to supporting the system of deregulation and implicit guarantee for when the bubble bursts, there would be a bailout. Or think about this story. Everybody remembers, of course, the Deepwater Horizon. It led many people to say, how is it that such an experimental drilling structure could have been allowed without any extensive environmental impact or risk studies being performed. After all, where I come from in Boston, we've just gone through a nine-year and 10,000-page environmental impact study to allow us to have this green energy wind power project off of the coast of Massachusetts. So in the context of the Deepwater Horizon, what was the environmental impact analysis that was performed there? The answer is there were 17 pages of environmental impact analysis filed before they got an exemption from any further analysis being required. Leading our Congress, I apologize, the sound here is not going to be loud enough, but our Congress to, of course, say they were shocked. I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. But of course, it was our Congress that had required that these approvals be granted within 30 days, allowing these experiments to be launched off our coast, leading to this disaster. And again, we say, why is this? The political scientists say none can prove, but this is what we can say, endless campaign cash buying precisely this result. Or think finally about the health care reform. Now, of course, Barack went to Washington promising he was going to change the way Washington worked. And many wonder whether health care is evidence that he changed D.C. Ezra Klein, a fantastic uh, uh, columnist of the Washington Post, whose columns I agree with 100% of the time, except for this one column, talked about passing health care as, quote, the twilight of the interest groups, as he wrote 
the Obama administration succeeded at neutralizing every single industry. Now, of course, that's not quite accurate as a description of what happened here. My understanding is closer to Glenn Greenwald, who wrote in response to Ezra's paper, if by neutralizing, Ezra means bribing and accommodating them to such an extreme degree that they ended up affirmatively supporting a bill that lavishes them with massive benefits, then he's absolutely right. But being able to force the government to bribe and accommodate you is not a reflection of your powerlessness. Quite the opposite. The way this bill has been shaped is the ultimate expression and bolstering of how Washington has long worked. One can find reasonable excuses for why it had to be done that way, but one cannot reasonably deny that it was, leading me to perhaps the most important philosopher of the 20th century, David Byrne. It's same as it ever was in Washington today. Okay, now, in these four examples, I have done something to your brain. Okay? At a minimum, I have weakened your confidence in a belief that there was a sensible result produced in each of these political contexts. And I've done that, weakened the confidence that you might have in this view, because in your brain, when money appears in the wrong place, your confidence or trust begins to disappear. And that's not just in the context of politics. Now, how many of you will recognize this chemical here? Not many. I wouldn't, of course. I wouldn't even be able to pronounce its name except for its short abbreviation, BPA. I don't know. BPA, of course, is now getting a lot of attention as a chemical that's added in most soft plastics. 96% of us have very high amount of BPA in our system right now. Many people ask the question whether BPA is safe. Most of us believe, sure, it must be safe. Why else would it be in our environment if it weren't safe? The research about BPA is contested. And it's that contestation that leads many people to say, well, OK, there's disagreement. There's no conclusive evidence that it's not safe. But when you take that evidence and you divide it between research supported by the BPA industry and research supported independently, there's a very stark contrast here. So of industry-funded studies, 0% find any harm caused by BPA. 100% find no harm. But of independent studies, 14% find no harm, and 86% find harm from this additive. Significant harm, explaining some of the most important health uh, uh, consequences we've seen growing up in our kids over the past 20 years. And this fact alone, my pointing this out to you, will now make you less sure about your views about the safety of BPA. Or think about cell phones. Cell phones safe? Well, 70% of us believe cell phones are safe. That even though it's a tiny bit of microwave radiation being emitted right next to your brain, no danger to you at all. In fact, the research here is also contested. Again, reaffirming our view that it must be safe. It's not overwhelmingly concluded that it's not safe. And like smokers in the 1960s, we couldn't really imagine giving up our cell phones. So we're going to believe it's safe. Well, once again, if you take the research and divide it between industry research and independent research, the numbers are quite startling. Industry-funded research, 28% find a biologic effect caused by this presence of microwave radiation so close to cells. 72% find no harmful consequence from that. 33% of independent studies find no biologic effect, but 67% of independent studies find a biologic effect. Once again, a radical difference, merely because the difference in funding, and I can tell you I have now once again weakened the confidence you might have had about the safety in cell phones. Now, we conducted a study at Harvard's uh, 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 psychology lab to figure out whether this was a general feature about the way people viewed the world. And what we found in a wide range of contexts is merely by placing money in the wrong place, people 
weaken their confidence in the underlying claims being made and weaken their trust in the institutions making the claims. This is not an argument against money. It's not saying that we ought to have socialist economy where everybody's making the same amount. It's not saying money is bad. It's saying money in the wrong place weakens people's confidence in the underlying claims being made. Now, the lack of confidence that we the people have in this institution is now quite profound. In a study we just uh, completed two weeks ago, this organization, the Global Strategies Group, found that 75% of Americans believe, quote, money buys results in Congress. That number is pretty much the same, whether it's Democrat or Republican, 81% of Democrats, 71% of Republicans. But I can tell you from studying previous similar surveys that when the Democrats controlled Congress, it was reversed. It was 81% of Demo Republicans who thought money bought results and 71% of Democrats. But the point is, this is the one thing we all agree with. Money buys results in Congress. And that belief leads the vast majority of us to have no confidence in that institution. Indeed, Gallup's last poll about confidence in Congress found 11% of Americans have confidence in our Congress. 11%. Right? There were more people who believed in King George III at the time of the revolution than believe in our Congress today. And for good reason, we have this skeptical view. It's a fantastic book by this Washington Post uh, executive editor, Robert Kaiser, So Damn Much Money, talking about the rise of a new and virulent form of lobbying inside of Washington, leading to what he calls a profound corruption of Washington. But this corruption is not the kind of Rob Lagojevich corruption. It's not the kind of money being handed around in brown paper bags, bribery form of corruption. This kind of corruption is in plain sight. It's not illegal. The activities engaged in are completely above board, reported to everybody. But what those activities produce is an economy of influence, where lobbyists benefit members who benefit special interests, who then benefit the lobbyists. Each of these depends upon the other with an extraordinary power being developed, as Kaiser says, in the last 30 years of special interest having a power over Congress. Now, what he describes is a system of dependence, a dependence that the members of Congress have upon the funders of their campaigns. And that is not the dependence that our framers intended. The framers of our Constitution gave us a republic, as they called it. But they meant by a republic a representative democracy. And what a representative democracy was, as Federalist Number 52 puts it, is a democracy where government is dependent upon the people alone dependent upon the people alone. But we don't have that democracy anymore. Instead, we've developed a system where instead of the people being the dependency that drives our Congress, it is the funders who are the prime dependency that drives too much of what our Congress does, and the people have become secondary. And if it's not clear to anybody, let's make it clear, the funders are not the people. What the funders want and the funders demand is not the same thing as what the people want and the people would demand. And if Congress could pay attention to the people, they would do different things from what they do in a world where they must pay attention to the funders. In a world where they spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress or to make sure their party gets back in the majority in Congress, they develop a sixth sense an ability constantly to understand how what they say and what they do will weaken their ability to raise money from the people they know they need to raise money from. They become shapeshifters in this game. This wonderful quote from Leslie Byrne, who is a Democrat from Virginia, said that when she first came to Congress, she was told by a colleague, always lean to the green. And then to make sure everybody understood, she said, 
he was not an environmentalist. The point is that recognition leads them to a path that makes sure that their funding is secure. And once secure in their funding, they don't need to worry about the voters because the voters will be bought by the money they have secured. This process is corrupting. Not corrupting of congressmen. I believe our Congress is filled with the most honest, in the sense of avoiding bribery congressmen we've ever had in our history. Instead, corrupting of Congress itself. Now, political scientists look at this and say, well, actually, we're not sure if that's true. We can't actually see the connection between the contributions and the results. So we're not actually able to show in the numbers, in our regression equations, that there is that kind of control. But this is what we can be sure of. We can be sure of this belief. Most Americans, as I said, 75% of Americans believe money buys results in Congress. Overwhelmingly, that's what we believe. And that belief has an effect. As Rock the Vote, the youth group that registers people to vote, found in the last election, the number one reason why their members were not turning out to vote was, quote, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. The belief that money buys results makes it irrelevant for most people to spend time worrying about politics, because why would you unless you had the money? And it's not just kids. The vast majority did not vote in our election, last cycle election. People who could have voted could have been registered to vote because of this belief. Now, what could we do about this? What would a solution look like? Well, my view is the core solution has got to be to find a way to make the funders the people. To make it so we don't have funders who are different from the people and therefore drive the attention of Congress away from the people, but instead make them the same. And the way to do that is to follow the model of now three states in the United States, the red state Arizona, the mixed state Maine, and the very blue state Connecticut, to have small dollar funded elections, which means elections where Congress people would run raising just small dollar contributions alone, and that would be the only money they cared about. Now, in my view, the promised land in this solution looks something like this. We could say it's a mix of grants and Franklin's. I'm going to describe a system here, and it mixes both General Grant, President Grant, and Benjamin Franklin. Here's the first fact you've got to understand to make sure the system's understandable. Every voter in America produces at least $50 in revenue to our treasury, whether it's income taxes or cigarette taxes or gas taxes or taxes when they fly in an airplane. At least $50 of revenue comes into the treasury because of every voter. So take that fact and say that the first $50 that gets into the Treasury because of a particular voter, that first $50 we're going to call a democracy voucher. And that voucher, the voter gets to allocate to whatever candidate the voter wants. They can give it all to one candidate. They can split it among a number of candidates, however the, candidate, the voter wants to allocate it. And then in addition to those voucher dollars, citizens could contribute a maximum of one Ben Franklin, $100, to any particular candidate. And candidates opting into this system would agree to only take those kinds of contributions, only take the voucher contributions, and only take the $100 contribution cap for any citizen. So nobody would ever be able to give effectively more than $150 uh, but people would give a mix between zero and $150, depending on how they allocate their money. Now, if they didn't allocate their voucher, then that would, money would flow back to the party in which they are registered. We have a big question about what to do with independence, but let's just put that aside for a second. But if you don't allocate it, it goes back to your party. Now, the critical thing to recognize about this system is that $50 a voter is $6 billion in the political system. In 2008, the total amount raised and spent by all candidates running for Congress was $1.8 billion. How much? $1.8 billion. So this amount of money is significantly more than the amount of money the existing system produced. 
And when the states have done a system like this, there's a significant number, more than 80% in Connecticut, which opt into this right away. So what I want you to recognize is imagine we had a world where 80% of members of Congress opted into this system where the only money they took was small dollar contributions by their vouchers or up to $100 each. If it were small dollar contributions alone, then whenever Congress did something stupid, which of course they'll do something stupid regardless of what we do, but when they did something stupid, it might either be because there are too many Republicans versus Democrats or too many Democrats versus Republicans, but the one thing you could not believe was that they did their stupid thing because of the money. That system removes money from the mix of what might be influencing them to do one thing or another and makes trust in this system possible. Now that, in my view, is the promised land, but I'm realistic enough to recognize that the promised land is far away from where we are right now. And the question is, so how do we get there? What steps do we have to take as a party, as a people, to get there? And I think the critical step we have to take is to begin to teach, Democrats in particular, but if this were a Republican club, I would have a story that showed Republicans why this is true for them as well, that we will get nothing of what we really want until we get this change first. It's not that money in politics is the most important problem. It's just the first problem. Think about an alcoholic who could be losing his wife, his job, his liver. Those are really serious problems. But what we know about the alcoholic is he's not going to solve any of those problems until he solves his alcoholism first, and so too with this dependency that our Congress is in the middle of. It, too, will not solve any of its problems until it solves this problem first, and it will not be able to give us what we as Democrats want until we solve this problem First, So we have to work to focus people on this problem. You remember an inspirational author from Massachusetts, Henry David Thoreau, who wrote in 1846, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. In too many cases, and especially in the Democratic Party, good souls among us hack at the branches of evil for better health care, for global warming legislation, for food safety legislation, for proper regulation of our uh, courts and trade. But too few who strike at the root, the root that blocks us from getting any of these changes done. Now, let me end with one final story here. Um, when I grew up, I only wore Keds, my favorite shoes. Uh, they're made by Stridewright. Stridewright's a company started by an extraordinary man, Arnold Hyatt. He's a little bit humble, so the biggest photo I could find of Arnold Hyatt on the, on the World Wide Web is just this big. This does not a big self-promoter. But he is a very loyal Democrat. And in 1996, he was the second largest contributor to the Democratic Party. So in 1997, then-President Bill Clinton invited Arnie and 30 other fat cats to a dinner at the Mayflower to tell the president exactly what the president should do. We don't have any photographs of this event, but what happened was each of the fat cats stood up and told the president what the president should do. And the final fat cat to stand up was Arnie Hyatt. And I kind of envision it like this. There Arnie stands up before the president and said, Mr. President, I know you're a great admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So Arnie said, I want you to put yourself in Roosevelt's shoes in 1939. When he came, reluctantly came, to recognize that he needed to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Because Arnie said, you too, Mr. President, you too have to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Not a war against fascists, a war against fat cats, people like us, 
People who think merely because we're rich, we have the right to direct our democracy the way we believe it should be directed. People who believe they're entitled to pick up the phone and speak to a senator or the president of the United States. Until you wage a war against us, we will not have a democracy again. As you can imagine, in that room filled with fat cats, when Arnie sat down, there was some silence in the room. Uh, the only published account we have of the evening, published in this book, describes Clinton's response as effectively slashing Hyatt to pieces, humiliating him in front of the group. Now, 15 years later, it's time for us to recognize, I think, that it was Arnie, not the president, who was right. We do need to convince a reluctant nation to wage this war to save democracy. But where Arnie was wrong was his belief that we could rely upon politicians to wage this war for us. We can't. This war is something we, citizens, must wage. It's something we, citizens, must do to reclaim this republic. When Franklin walked out of the Constitutional Convention, he was stopped by a woman on that street in Philadelphia and asked, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? And Franklin said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. A republic, a representative democracy, a system dependent upon the people alone. We have lost that republic. But you need to join us in this struggle to get it back. Thank you very much.